It's such a special day here at the church that uh, one of my very best friends in the entire world, his name is Jeffrey Portman. He's a Viking, okay? He's Norwegian, and, uh, and he, he, he is the church multiplication director, which is basically our network of churches. He leads a movement of church plants that we are a part of, and we're on a mission to plant 10,000 churches, and we want to see a healthy church in every community. So when I travel during the week and you see me in places like Columbus, Ohio, or Richmond, Virginia. The, I am training up church planters underneath his authority, and I am grateful to have him here. We went to the Angus Barn last night for dinner. Can I get an amen, somebody? Oh, y'all don't know nothing about that 44-ounce tomahawk steak, man. It was so good. And uh, he has a word for you today. I'm so grateful for him. And so would you stand to your feet at both of our locations and welcome to the stage, Pastor Jeffrey Portman. All right. Well, hey, what's up, Focus Church? How you doing? And I'm not forgetting our Apex Campus, our online. You can grab a seat. Go ahead, grab a seat. Man, I love your church. And, you know, one of the reasons is because uh, we pray for your church. And we pray for your pastors. You know, you're part of something special. I'm just going to get situated here. Uh, I want to just take a moment just to recognize your pastor. Um, I don't do this because I have to. This isn't perfunctory. This is because... God's using uh, Pastor Michael and Ashton to shape our nation. And I know the, the, the impact locally is incredible. And I just want to say, though, that sometimes like a fish in the water, you don't uh, see it because you live there. But um, Michael is a voice to our nation. In fact, he'll be speaking uh, this August uh, to a gathering of uh, 10,000 pastors from across the nation. And so the... the not just the reputation, but the kingdom impact is um, because of what's happening here. But it's also not limited to here. And I just want us to honor them publicly. Um, my wife's with me today. Yeah, would you just take a moment? Love it. Would you stand, sweetheart? I want to introduce my wife, Joanne. We are, we have been married. Now, yesterday was our 28th uh, wedding anniversary. And uh, so we ended up at this restaurant, like, was it the Golden Corral? No, it wasn't that. It was, uh, bro, I told Michael, I might need, like, sometimes I'll teach from a stool. After yesterday, I might need a recliner, right? Because, you know, the meat sweats, right? But we, uh, we're grateful for God's hand on us and the privilege we have to, to serve the assemblies of God. And, you know, this is just a cool thing uh, for us just to, before I jump into the talk, just to recognize God is still calling people. He's still equipping people. He's still reminding people, as you heard from Pastor Michael, that he's a redeeming, he's a redemptive God. And so last year, uh, Church Multiplication Network, with which this church invests in, prays for, is a part of, we, in a crazy COVID-filled year, planted 214 churches. And that's like in this chaos. And since 2008, 4,214 churches have been planted. And we know that God's not done because he came to seek and save all of the lost. And who's that? Everybody, right? So I just want to say thank you for your, uh, your voice that's not just local again, but it's shaping our nation. And uh, on behalf of my wife and I and our team, what a blessing it is for us to be here today. You know, Father's Day is a big deal. I know it's not as big as Mother's Day, I get it, but it is still a big deal. Can I get a witness, ladies, right? Right? I understand. I'm a dad. I've been married for a while. We have two sons. I want to introduce my family, our family. This is our uh, kids there. On the outside is Josiah. So my wife is Samoan, and I'm Norwegian. So growing up at our house, something was pillaged and burned every day, okay? But so Josiah there, uh, we call him man-child. He's on the right side there. And that's his fiance Maria. They're getting married uh, in this September. We're so excited for that. And then on the left is Justice and his wife, Brittany. And they're youth pastors at our home uh, church, uh, New Hope Church, outside of Seattle. And that's before we stepped into this role of leading church multiplication, we had the privilege of planting a church um, outside of Seattle. And uh, we just thank God for the, the kingdom of God, uh, more than our kingdom, the kingdom. And I love that our kids are on mission with Jesus. And today I want to talk about two things. I want to talk about storms. 
I want to talk about anchors. The thing about storms is they don't call ahead, and they don't make an appointment, and they kick the door in, right? I mean, the, the, the storm doesn't say, hey, listen, two weeks from now, your life's going to blow up, right? The unexpected, seemingly out of nowhere divorce, the, uh, the, the doctor's result, right? The, the downturn in maybe your business. I mean, none of us expected the, the pandemic. We didn't know that some of the tensions with our political dynamics would be coming the way they did. Storms do not make reservations, but God is still the God who holds firm in every storm. The moment, though, that we begin to take our eyes off of the prize, off of Jesus, what we have is mission confusion, and we start to wonder, like, God, are you still good? If you're still good, how come fill in the blank? God, if you're, and we start to wrestle with, but here's what's powerful. A storm reminds us of our need for an anchor, and Jesus is that anchor. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, dividing soul and spirit. Joined in marrow, it says it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. What does that tell us? It's an anchor for us. It it solidifies us in every situation, in every season. You know, the, the journey the disciples were on with Jesus was one where they expected him to be uh, put in his rightful position, which would be the, the king, right? He would be the, the one who lorded over the land. In fact, they even asked the question, hey, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And God says, listen, only the Father knows the time for that, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So their idea was that Jesus was this conquering king, but what they didn't realize is that he was a sacrificial lamb. So when he begins to say in John 16, he begins to remind them and tell them about what's to come, that there's going to be storms, there's going to be pain, there's going to be uncertainty, there's going to be dynamics that you don't understand, and you start to wonder, again, God, if you're good, how come? If, if you're good, if you're real, if you care, if you're not out there somewhere far off and distant, why am I feeling this way? And here's what Jesus says to them. He says, I've told you these things. What things? That you're going to face difficulties. But he also promised the Holy Spirit. He says, I've told you these things so that in me, notice it's not in something or someone else. In me, you you may have peace. And Paul writes, God gives peace that the world doesn't understand. In fact, that peace guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. And there's this (laughs) <laughs> Not so ex- Like, you ever want to use a black highlighter on the scripture? Like, the stuff you like, you use yellow or pink, right? But ever you want to use a black highlighter? Like, I don't like that part. I wish that wasn't in there, right? Here's, this is one of those. In this world, you will have trouble. But see, that's not the end of the story. That's not the last chapter. It's the most recent chapter. And God puts a period, and he turns the page, and he says this. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Man, that's, a, that's an anchor for our souls today. That's a reminder of the goodness of God, regardless of circumstances and seasons. Between my sophomore and junior year at Northwest University, outside of Seattle, I worked on a fishing boat out of Kodiak, Alaska. And before we flew up to Anchorage and then into Kodiak, we went actually down to uh, Seattle where the boat was in dry dock. And all of the you know, preparations for the upcoming season were taking place. And I'd, I'd been on boats a lot, but I'd never been on a commercial fishing boat. It was a 65-foot boat. So I remember going downtown to the, 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 um, the boat dock down there, and there's these giant boats on these blocks. And I climb up this huge ladder to get on board. And it was interesting. I went into the, ca- to the, um, the cabin where, you know, the captain would have, this was his private place. I, I went into the restroom, which was kind of like uh, being in a phone booth, right? I, I went into the galley where we're going to have all of our meals. I went into the top house. I sat in the captain's chair. I went onto the deck. I went onto the bow. I, I went into our sleeping quarters. And by the way, if you are at all claustrophobic, you probably shouldn't work on a fishing boat. But we're in there, and, you know, like my, my bunk tops right there. You know what's interesting, though? Not one time as I toured the boat, not one time where we talked about what we were going to do, not one time during the entire day did I ever even think about or ask about the anchor. I didn't even think about it. I didn't even know there was an anchor. Now, it kind of common sense is that there would be an anchor. But here's the thing. You don't need an anchor until the storm hits. 
And most of our lives, we're like, I'm just good. And out of somewhere, something, remember, storms don't call ahead. They kick the door in and they surprise us. And then in, it's in that moment that it's, it's revealed to us if we are anchored to something or someone. And if that anchor actually holds. Now, I want you to hear this. Listen, Focus Church. Every one of us in every seat that's occupied, everyone watching online, everyone at the Apex campus, everyone you know, your grandma, your great niece and nephew, your pastor and the Pope have something in common. And here's what it is. We're all prone to wander and drift. Our natural tendency is to drift. And here's what's interesting. We don't drift towards intimacy or discipline. We don't drift towards good things. So y'all, you know this, we drift from them. I don't drift towards Bible reading and generosity and forgiveness. I drift from it. So here's the question you have to ask. Am I going somewhere on purpose or am I going somewhere on accident? Every one of us have a natural tendency to drift. That's what the scripture tells us. From Adam and Eve, remember, they're, they're, the culmination of, of creation was Eve. Adam and Eve are in the garden. They're with the animals. And all they had to do was one thing. <laughs> avoid that tree. But what do they do? They just drift. They start to wonder. Well, I mean, did, and this is what the enemy whispers. Did God really say? See, what happens in those moments is what we're anchored to will either hold or it won't. So you're not alone, and I'm not alone. None of us watching online are alone with our natural tendency to drift. But the question is this. If our natural tendency is to drift... How do we avoid the drift? Now, I want you to hear some good news. And you heard it earlier with this beautiful word, redemption. God does for us what we can't do for ourselves. But I want you to hear this. And I wrote this in my notes. Your past does not define you. And it doesn't determine who you are. It doesn't have that power. Only Jesus does. Joanne and I, my wife was born in Hawaii. And so that's one of our favorite places to go to. We... we just spent last week at the beach uh, here in North Carolina. It was wonderful. But Hawaii is probably our favorite place on the planet, right? And so we were on uh, celebrating our 25th wedding anniversary a few years ago. And we're in Maui. And we have two decisions we make when we get up every day. Number one, are we going to go to the pool or are we going to go to the beach? That's all the decisions I want to make on vacation. Maybe later, what are we going to eat, okay? But it can't be complex. i got a life full of decision making. We both do. So... We just said, we're going to go to the beach. Well, we had got these air mattresses, and I, vol I was voluntold to, to blow them up. And so, you track with me there? Um, so I blew those up, and it didn't take long, an hour or so. And so, um, just kidding, it was like 45 minutes. But um, got the air mattress blown up, and then we just began to float out in the water. Now, you might not be a beach person, but you can track with me that it's peaceful. The water's just gently moving, Right? The wind is just perfect. It's like, it's not hot. It's not cold. It's like, like 82 degrees. Your foot's hanging off. And it's like, this is paradise. And we're just relaxing. And we did that for a while. And then we look up because we're just relaxing. And we look up and we realize we had drifted about a quarter of a mile away from our, our hotel. Well, well, how come? Because there's currents. Now, the thing about a current is they're imperceptible to the eye, but they're still felt. Like a leaf in the wind, you're not sure what caused it, but something did. And we find ourselves, and we have what? We have drifted. It wasn't because we're bad. It's because of the current we were in. And we find ourselves, a quarter mile, like, man, that's a, how, do we get, how do we get down here? So Joanne said, hey, well, can you, you know, pull us back? So I'm like, no problem. I'll stop relaxing and um, you know, she's already tan, but I'll, I'll, I'll stop getting some sun, and that's fine. And I'll, I'll just swim us back. So I swam us back. And we we're trying to figure out, how do we stay together? Because the waves wanted to pull us apart and separate us. And so I came up with a solution. I'll throw my leg over top of your leg, and then we'll, like, get a stay. Even when a wave comes, we kind of stay with each other, right? And she's like, you can't do that. I'm like, well, how come I can't do that? She said, because I'll get a tan line. <laughs> and again, I was reminding her, you're already brown. Okay, um, so that's how it en ended up happening. And so um, isn't it interesting that if we're not careful, we end up somewhere on accident? I mean, have you ever one felt yourself saying, how did I get here? Uh -uh -uh. Wherever that here is, how did I get here? 
And it's not like I'm really glad I'm here. It's like, how did I get here? But let me tell you, there's another one. It's like this. How did I get here? And this one's full of hope. You're like, I can't believe how good God is. I can't believe the friendships he put in my life. I can't believe his favor over my family, my marriage. my bi- I, how, did, how did I get here? How did I find this church? How did I get here? And this is the other one. How did I get here? And one of them's full of hope and one of them's marked by regrets. But both of them are the results of currents that we put ourselves in. And a current will put us and push us somewhere. And again, the question is, do I go there on purpose or on accident? Two critical questions. Why do we drift? The second question is this. How do we avoid the drift? You know, when I think about parenting and the journey that Joanne and I have been on with our boys, I think about some of the currents that we have pushed our boys into that have taken them somewhere. Now, once they get in there, you have to choose to stay, right? Parenting is not about rescuing our kids. It's about focusing our kids, and then they begin to choose. They begin to make decisions that a man or woman of God would make. But I think about the moments where our boys would come to us and say, man, uh, mom and dad, you can't believe this. This is so amazing. Look at what God's doing. And then there's also these moments of, uh, how did I get here? And we know this. The answer is this. They put themselves in currents that took them somewhere. And it wasn't always a storm because sometimes the enemy's uh, attempts and his strategy is very subtle. Isn't that true? He's not always sneaky in in a way that's obvious. Often it's just a little bit like subvertive. In fact, I believe the, the enemy's best weapon is deception. And if he can get you and me to believe something that's not true as truth, he's halfway there. And that puts us in a current that pushes us somewhere. I want you to see a picture. This is um, t- the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. And where we used to live is about 15 minutes from here. And they call it the Tacoma Narrows. And you, obviously, you put a bridge where the land narrows. That makes sense. So the bridge shorter, right? But because the land narrows, because everything converges together, the current in there is crazy. Looks peaceful, right? It looks beautiful. It's picturesque. But the reality is there's a raging current that goes through there. Because when things get pressed, when your life gets shoved together, when you have, I have to make this decision and this decision. When I'm wrestling with, man, how do I manage? How do I, how do I create margin? There's, there's this tension. What happens is the currents pick up. And what was before subtle and easy is now rapid. And it's sometimes it's even alarming. There are moments and places in your life, and it's typically when a storm hits, that she realized there's some things that are pushed. And isn't it, our, isn't it our natural tendency? Instead of leaning in, sometimes we lean back. Instead of being more faithful, sometimes like, I'm just going to, I feel like I've earned a break. You ever, ever thought that? Like, I just kind of, like, I feel that way at night when I snack. I'm like, I've been really good most of the day. So, Lord, I just want to celebrate this moment with you. And then I'm like, how did I get here? Right? And, okay, I could feel a witness on this one. Okay? Here's what the scripture tells us. We must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we've heard so that we don't drift away. What what are you all susceptible to? Drift. And you're either going to, as I've said, go somewhere on purpose or somewhere on accident. And and, and my experience is no one ends up somewhere on accident and was like, I'm so glad I'm here. It's often marked with regret. So why do we need to pay more careful attention to what we've heard? And maybe, maybe another question is, why would I not want to pay attention to what I've heard? And isn't it interesting? Sometimes I read the Bible, I'm like, ah, I know that's good for me, but I don't want to do it. It's like vegetables. I'm like, I know if I eat my Wheaties, or maybe not Wheaties, right? they're kind of sugarful, but if I eat my, my veggies, I'm going to be strong, right? We, we train up our kids, right? And as a spiritual infant, our goal is to get away from spiritual milk and to get into solid things. But what happens is sometimes I'll read something and we'll go, ah, I don't want to do that. And you know what it comes down to? Apex Campus, here's what it comes down to. Control. How many, are, how many are old enough to remember before remote controls? Let me see your hands. Now, for those who are younger, younger generation, I want you to hear this. There was a, this is a crazy. This is back when Moses was alive. But there was a season of life where you would have to get up from your couch to change the channel. And it was horrible. It was horrible. I can't believe people lived through it. And so sometimes like, my dad would be watching football Sunday mornings after church, you know, Sunday afternoon. 
And uh, he'd be like, hey, Jeffrey, come in here. I'm like, oh, man, my dad loves me. He wants me to watch football. Nah, he wants me to change the channel. It's on channel five. I need it on channel seven. Y'all also remember when uh, the, the, the picture wasn't as clear as it is now? Like you couldn't see the dew on the grass back in the day. You just knew there was something green that's probably grass, right? And so sometimes the, the antenna would bust, and so you would have to hold the antenna thing. And my dad would be like, okay, turn your body. Okay, stop right there, right? It, what would happen also was when, when before remotes, the, the, the knob would break because of excess use. And so you'd have to get a Phillips screwdriver and shove that bad boy in there, and that was how you turned the channels. What happened when we got this? We got control. And the problem is, in our world, we kind of have this false idea that I should have control of everything, and I don't have to surrender or submit or say, God, I give up control. Because at my house, whoever's in charge holds this. But that's true of your life, too. And the problem is, God's like, I, can, I, can, I, can I have the remote? Because I want to put you in a current. I want to I wanna get you to a channel that's going to be best for you. And we're like, okay, but, but can I have, like, the weekends just for myself? Can I get the remote back on the Fridays? Or, or maybe I'll let God, I'm, oh, Sunday, it's yours. God, here's my life. Wednesdays, if you're all in, if you're really committed, you're in a small group, you're like, I really have, God, I give this to you for that two and a half hours. <laughs> we must pay more careful attention to what we've heard so we don't drift away. And at some point, it's not just a storm that's way out there. It's a storm that hits our lives, and we begin to wonder, God, are you good? Do you care? Are you still there? And what he's saying is this. Will you give me control, even in the storm? Hebrews uh, 7 chapters later says this. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Listen, I'm describing the God who wants to be the anchor for our lives, for your marriage, for your finances, for your relationships, for your hopes and your dreams. So non-scientific poll, let me see, show of hands, even Apex Campus, if you're online, maybe, you know, hit, hit, hit up an emoji or something. Non-scientific, how many of you have a good memory? Let me see your hands. Okay, how many of you have a bad memory? Let me see your hands. How many of you don't remember the question? Let me see your hands, okay. The, here, here's the situation. We sometimes hold on to stuff we should let go of, and we let go of stuff we should hold on to. And there's this promise God gives us. If we tether ourselves, if we anchor ourselves to his word, our life is going to go somewhere on purpose rather than on accident. He's going to cover us. He's going to shield us. He's going to lead us, and he's going to guide us. I love what Paul wrote to the church in Ephesians. It says this, finally be strong in who? The Lord. Not in yourself, not in your retirement, not in your own plan or strategy or wily ways, not in your own experience. I'm, I'm 55 now. I'm 75. I, I'm mature. I'm 14. I got stuff figured out. No, it's not in your own self, but be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. And then what are we, what are we instructed to do? Put on the full armor of God. What is it, what is it saying? Prepare yourself. A storm's coming. You prepare your home, you prepare your your relationships when you know a storm's coming. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Now listen to this. See if you hear a current in here, okay? For our struggle is not against the obvious, the flesh and blood, but against the powers of this dark world and against spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. Can you see them? No, but you feel them. There are currents that want to put you somewhere. So you're like, man, how did I get here? Because you got into a current. A storm raged in your life and it caused you to drift. And instead of being anchored to God's word, instead of being anchored to truth, you end up somewhere on accident. And the opposite is we tether ourselves. We put on the full arm of God. I know storms are coming. I know challenges are going to be part. That's part of the story of life, the brokenness, the pain, the hurt, the suffering. That's what shapes us. Consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. Why? The testing of your faith. The testing of your faith says it's going to bring maturity. There's going to be fulfillment. Now, we don't want that, but we need that. Finally, he says, be strong. Not on the screen, but I want you to hear three or four verses later. He says this. And after you have done everything to stand, stand. Here's what he's saying. And I thank the prop people. 
What he's saying is this. Get an anchor. Make sure your life is anchored. Here's the tension. We can live by the rock and not on it. And so we can weather some storms, right? I go to church sometime. I pick up my Bible occasionally. I'm a person of prayer. God, as a student, God, help me to remember that which I haven't studied. And he's like, <laughs> no. But what happens when we're anchored? What happens when our life is, is fully immersed in? Now, this is, this is a tension and a challenge, but it's possible. Because God doesn't say, put on some of the armor of God. Grab that helmet. Grab the bless, breastplate of righteousness. Grab the sword of the Spirit. And some of us, like, when, when the storm hits, we're like, we, we pull out our sword and it's like tweezers. <laughs> I'm going to fight the enemy. We don't have tweezers of the Spirit. We have the sword of the Spirit. We have the power of God to help us navigate any circumstance in every season. Here's the tension. Sometimes we have what I would call false anchors. And false anchors are those things that we thought would hold. I thought, man, if I just got a bigger house, maybe you said if I got a different spouse, I found myself saying if, if I could just have a better job, if I just got that promotion, oh, then I'll be anchored. If I could just be picked for the team, if I could be selected, if I could get the, the promotion and finally feel like I am somebody, it's a false anchor. And false anchors aren't revealed often to be false until the storm hits. I mentioned to you I worked in that fishing boat in Alaska, and the first trip out, a storm hit. Now, remember, when I was on the boat in Seattle, I didn't even think about the anchor. I didn't even know if we had an anchor. But when the storm hit, we were desperate for the anchor. It was the only thing that would hold us. It was the only thing that would put us steadily in, in, in order to be able to uh, address, deal with, and navigate what we were in the midst of. Now, what was interesting I'll invite the band as I'm about to close. What was interesting is I hadn't thought about it till the boat started rocking. I hadn't thought about it till the wind started beating us down. And it was in that moment that I'm like, God, I'm so grateful for an anchor. Now, you know this, Focus Church. You don't have to live life drifting in any current. You don't have to find yourself saying, man, <laughs> God, you're only good on Sundays. You can be anchored to God's word. Now, here's something that's incredibly life-giving in the midst of that storm, as scary as it was. The captain knew what I did it. He knew about a safe harbor. So as waves are crashing over the top house, a 65-foot boat with waves crashing over the top house, the whole crew is in, uh, up on the, the, the top deck with the captain, and we are riding out this storm. And when the captain looked at us and he's afraid, we're like, ah. But he knew what we did it, that there was a harbor not far from there that we could get into for safety. And that's exactly what we did. We slowly made our way, fighting the waves. Isn't it true sometimes? It's like, I'm just tired of fighting. I'm t I just want to quit. And that's what you can't quit. It's always too soon to quit. You got to keep going. You got to keep fighting. You got to keep fighting for your family and for your kids. You got to keep fighting for your marriage. You fight for your small group. You fight for your neighbors. You fight for the people in your, in your department that you're in. Why? Because God put you there. Well, like, I, I'm tired of fighting. I'm tired of bucking the waves. But the captain knows what you don't. He wasn't surprised by the storm. He's the God of the storms also. Now, does he cause them? No, but sometimes he allows them. And the captain didn't even say anything. And sometimes, isn't it true that the teacher's always silent during the test? Like, I kind of need some help. He's like, it's test time. So we made our way along the coast and into this harbor. No other boats in the harbor. The harbor was, honestly, maybe four times the size of this space. So it was big for space, but small for a harbor. And we made our way in, and then I heard the sound that still does my heart good whenever I hear it. And it was the sound of the anchor dropping off the bow of the boat. <laughs> the chain drop. <laughs> Splashes in the water. And what, four, five, ten minutes before, that's going to fall. 
was slamming, trying to just barely make it with the waves. Now as the anchor drops, there was calm. And here was a powerful moment. As the anchor dropped, the way the current was in this bay, the anchor was off the bow of the boat, and the, and the current began to take our boat just gently into a circle. And it wasn't scary. It was peaceful because we were safe. Listen, Father's Day 2021, if it was two weeks from now, it would be the same truth. Storms don't call ahead. They kick the door in. But the current you're in is going to determine if you end up somewhere on purpose or an accident. And when you get there, do you have an anchor that holds? Three questions, and I close. And these are critical questions. First one is this. Who or what have become false anchors in our lives? Is there someone or something that you thought would hold and the storm hit? You're like, that doesn't work. That's a false anchor. Listen, we've got to identify those things. We've got to ask ourselves, am I putting myself, number two, what am I doing to put myself in the current that takes me where I want to go? And I want to say this, you're here. That's part of it. Thank you for the decision you made to be here. Think about the neighbor. Think about the coworker or the classmate that needs to hear and experience what you're experiencing here at this church. What are you doing to help them get into a current? The last question is the most important question we'll ever ask or answer, and that's this. Have you, choose, have you chosen? Have you said, I choose to anchor my life to Jesus? I, I can't rescue myself, but he does for us what we can't do for ourselves. I just want to create space for grace as I close in prayer. Would you bow your head across the Apex campus, across the online platform, and even in this room? Would you? We just want to create space for grace where God meets us and he reminds us. Because here's the first question. Are you here and you say, listen, somehow, and I don't know if it was on purpose or an accident, I've got some false anchors in my life. And I thought if I could just get this, if I could just be here, but the reality is I don't and I can't. And now I find myself, myself saying, how did I get here? And my, maybe it's not outside, but on the inside, I'm like, how did I get here? Why am I thinking like this? How am I believing that lie? That's a false anchor. Listen, we can't commit these things to God. We say, God, I give you control of my life. I put down the remote and I hand it to you. Listen, Focus Church, you have to choose today. Again, and you'll have to choose tomorrow again, and you'll have to choose two months from now again. I'm going to put myself in a current that honors God, that brings out the, the divine design of my life, my family, my marriage. And we have this advocate. We have this helper called the Holy Spirit who enables us to do what we can't do on our own. And I just want to ask this last question. If you're here in this gathering online or at Apex and you're saying, Jeffrey, I don't know Jesus. I know about him, but I don't know him. And today you want to surrender your life to Christ. You want to become anchored to him and his work on the cross and the empty tomb. He redeems and he rescues. He transforms us. And here's what he does. He starts heart first, inside out. But the Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and will purify us from all unrighteousness. Every regret, every, every I wish I wouldn't have or I'm glad I did and then I now regret it. He meets us in that brokenness with healing. And here's our part. We simply say, God, help. We say, God, I need you. And I just want to invite you right now, if that's a decision you want to make, you want to cross over, the Bible says, from death to life. I want you to raise your hand and I want to pray for you today. Come on, we raise our hands saying, God, I don't have this. I don't have it figured out. I can't rescue myself, but you can. Come on, this is a moment the Bible says, today is the day of salvation. And God, I thank you. And you can pray something like this. If this is your desire, we pray, God, forgive me my sins. God, rescue me from the storm of my life. Put me into the current of your blessing and your love. Your kindness leads me to repentance. And today I choose to follow you. Listen, if that's a decision you made, there'll be an usher that brings 
one of these white cards which has this powerful declaration. My life has been changed. If you didn't raise your hand or you didn't respond what you want to, find one of the leaders with a, a lanyard on and say, can you, can you walk with me? Can you help me? And God, I pray for this great church. Lord, that in the midst of the circumstances and the seasons of life that we are and they are anchored to your word. God, we thank you that the days in front of them are greater than the days behind them. And today we declare this over Focus Church, your favor and your blessing, your supernatural provision, and God, most of all, more of you. And we declare this together in the name that is above every name, Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you, if you're able, would you stand across this room as we take some time to reflect and respond?